Welcome to Ancient World Studies. My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. Many of you have asked me where you can access versions of the ancient primary sources. In answer to your request, this channel is hosting a broadcast from Belfast Classics in conjunction with the Classical Association in Northern Ireland. These sources concern the death of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. They are from Appian, Civil Wars, Diocasius, Histories, Plutarch, Life of Antony, Suetonius, Life of Julius Caesar, Suetonius, Life of Augustus, and Virgil, the Aeneid. Note that snakes are emblems of the Egyptian monarchy, and a stylized image of the cobra, Uraeus, was worn on the pharaoh's headdress. The cobra was sacred to the goddess Isis, and Cleopatra Ptolemy believed that she was the incarnation of the goddess. She called herself the new Isis. Strabo is the earliest source for Cleopatra's suicide, and he could even have been in Alexandria at the time she died. Plutarch was writing more than a century after these events, and Dio Cassius a century later still. Dio may have based his account of the death of Cleopatra on the history source written by Olympus, who was Cleopatra's personal physician. Dio mentions the work of this man in his account. The following events are presented in approximate chronological order, but some incidents are presented by more than one ancient writer, so there is occasional repetition. A few accounts will overlap in time. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra Source Suetonius Life of Julius Caesar Passage 52 Julius Caesar had love affairs with queens too, including Inoue, the Moor, the wife of Bergodes. Nasso writes that he gave her and her husband many splendid gifts. But above them all was Cleopatra, who Julius Caesar often feasted with until daybreak. He wanted to travel through Egypt with her in her state barge, almost as far as Ethiopia, if his soldiers had not refused to follow him. Finally, he called her to Rome and would not let her leave until he had showered her with high honours and rich gifts. When she gave birth, Caesar allowed her to give his name to the child. In fact, according to certain Greek writers, this boy was very like Caesar in both looks and in his behaviour. Source Appian Civil Wars Book 2 Passage 102 Julius Caesar erected a temple in Rome to his ancestress, the goddess Venus, as he had vowed to do when he was about to begin the Battle of Pharsalus, which was the final battle of the Civil War. He laid out the ground around the temple, intending it to be for a forum for the Roman people. Now, this was not to be for buying and selling, but a meeting place for the transaction of public business, like the public squares of the Persians, where the people assemble to seek justice or learn the laws. He placed a beautiful image of Cleopatra by the side of the goddess, and it stands there to this day. Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. Source. Virgil. The Aeneid. Book 8, verse 800. Note. Describing the decoration on the shield of Aeneas, the Trojan warrior and legendary early founder of Rome. And depicted on the shield was Anthony, 
standing with his barbaric wealth and strange weapons. He was shown as the victor over the people of the dawn and the Eritrean shores of the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf. He brought with him Egypt, the strength of the East and furthest Bactria, Afghanistan. Following him was his shameless Egyptian wife, and when Apollo, the god of Actium, saw all this from above, he bent his bow for war. All Egypt turned in terror, as did the Indians and all Arabia and the Sabbateans. Source, Josephus. Antiquities of the Jews, Book 15, Passage 4. Cleopatra? Oh, she was an extravagant woman, and nothing was sufficient to satisfy her desires. She was a slave to her own lusts, and she wanted everything she could think of or imagine, and did her utmost to get it. She continually drove Anthony to take other people's lands and give them to her. As she travelled across Syria with Anthony, she tried to possess it. So he killed Lysanias, the son of Ptolemy, accusing him of bringing in the Parthians. She also requested that Anthony gave her Judea and Arabia and wanted him to take these countries away from their present governors. Well, as for Anthony, he was so entirely overcome by this woman. Now you wouldn't think by her conversation alone she could do this, but maybe he was in some way or other bewitched and did whatever she wanted. Yet, the greatest parts of her injustice made him so ashamed that he wouldn't always listen to her and he wouldn't always carry out some obviously outrageous deed, even when she tried to persuade him. He couldn't openly appear to be an unjust man by doing everything which she asked. But he couldn't totally refuse her. So he took some parts of each of the countries away from their former governors and he gave them to her. Thus he gave her the cities that were in the river Ethereus as far as Egypt excepting Tyre and Sidon, which he knew to have been free cities from the time of their ancestors. Although she often tried to force him to give her these as well. Source Valerius Petercolis Roman History Book 2 Passage 82 But as Anthony's love for Cleopatra grew, so did his vices. Encouraged by power and freedom and flattery, he decided to go to war. Previously, he had given orders that he should be called the new Father Liber the symbol of freedom of speech and associated with the rituals as a boy passed into manhood. And then, in a procession at Alexandria, he actually impersonated Father Liber. He wore a gold and saffron robe, and on his head he had an ivy wreath. He put on bushkins, 
the laced-up boots worn by actors. And he held the sacred thyra staff in his hand. This staff was made of fennel, topped with a large pine cone. Ivy and vine leaves were wound around the stem, and it was all decorated with berries. He rode out on the chariot of Bacchus, the god of wine and pleasure. Anthony's Endowments Source Diocasius Histories Book 49 Passage 41 After this, Anthony gave a feast in the assembly for all the Alexandrians and made Cleopatra and her children sit by his side. In the course of his address to the people, he commanded that she should be called the Queen of Kings. And Ptolemy, her son, who they call Caesarion, should be the King of Kings. And then he made a new distribution of provinces. And he gave them Egypt and Cyprus as well. He declared that it was true that one was the wife and the other was the son of the former Caesar, Julius. Anthony stated that he was doing this for Caesar's sake, although his real purpose was to criticise Octavian because he was only adopted and not the real son of Julius Caesar. While making this endowment, he promised to give his own children by Cleopatra the following districts. To Ptolemy, Syria, and the entire region west of the Euphrates as far as the Hellespont. To Cleopatra, the Cyrenica in Libya, to their brother Alexander, Armenia, and the rest of the counties east of the Euphrates as far as India. Anthony even bestowed these last regions as though they were already in his possession. The dispute between Mark Anthony and Octavian. Note. After the death of his first wife, Flavia, Mark Anthony married Octavia, Octavian's sister. They had two children. After Anthony began his relationship with Cleopatra, he abandoned Octavia and sent her back to her brother. Source, Diocasius, Histories, Book 50, Passage 1. These were the charges they made against each other to justify their conduct. They communicated partly by private letters and partly by public speeches made by Octavian and public messages from Anthony. On this pretext, they constantly sent envoys backwards and forwards, appearing to justify their complaints as much as possible. Ah, but at the same time, they would be reconnoitering each other's position. Meanwhile, they were collecting funds, supposedly for a different purpose and were preparing for war, as though it were against some other person. This continued until Anthony's supporters, Gnaeus Domitus and Gaius Sullius, became consuls. Then there was no further concealment, and Octavian and Anthony became openly hostile. 
Octavian's case against Anthony was firstly that he was holding Egypt and other countries without them being allocated to him by drawing random lots. Also, that he had executed Sextus Pompey, a man who Octavian had willingly spared. Furthermore, that by deceiving, arresting, and putting in change the Armenian king, Anthony had given the Roman people a bad reputation. But nonetheless, Octavian still demanded half the spoils of that conflict. But above all, Octavian reproached Anthony about Cleopatra and her children, who Anthony had acknowledged as his own and had given many bequests to them. A particular accusation was that Anthony was calling Cleopatra's boy Caesarium, which brought him into Octavian's own family. Source Suetonius, Life of Augustus, Passage 52 Mark Anthony declared to the Senate that Caesar really had acknowledged the boy and that Gaius Matthias and Gaius Oppius and other friends of Caesar knew this. Of these, Gaius Oppius published a pamphlet proclaiming that Cleopatra's baby was not Caesar's son. But this was an admission that the situation required an apology and a defence against the claim. Anthony sent two of his followers with a message to Octavian. Source, Dio Cassius, Histories, Book 50, Passage 3. Octavian was very glad to receive the two men in order to learn about Anthony's business. He wanted to know what Anthony was doing, what he planned to do, and what was written in his will. Octavian wanted to know the name of the man who held the will, for they had both attached their seals to it. Octavian became violently angry and at once searched for the document and seized it. He then carried it into the Senate and later into the Assembly and read it there. Because of the clauses it contained, nobody reproached Octavian for this unlawful behaviour. Anthony had borne witness that Caesarion was truly the son of Julius Caesar. Anthony had also bequeathed vast amounts to the children of the Egyptian queen that were being reared by him. He had also ordered that his body should be buried in Alexandria by Cleopatra's side. Source Dio Cassius, Histories, Book 50, Passage 4. The Romans were offended by this and started to believe other rumours. For example, it was said that if Anthony was victorious, he would give Rome to Cleopatra and transfer Roman power to Egypt. This made people so angry that even the best of Anthony's friends criticised him, not just his enemies and acquaintances. These friends were dismayed when they read about Anthony, but to avoid Octavian's suspicion, they were anxious to agree with everybody else. Anthony had been previously elected to the consulship but they deprived him of that and all of his other authority. 
they did not declare him an enemy in so many words. Because they were afraid this would mean his friends would also be considered enemies. But they didn't abandon him outright. But by one action, they showed what they were thinking. And they showed it better than words. They voted that anybody taking Anthony's side would be pardoned and praised, but only if they abandoned him and declared outright war upon Cleopatra. So they put on their military cloaks as if Anthony were nearby. And they went to the temple of Bologna, the Roman goddess of war, and with Octavian performing all the customary rites as a priest who makes a declaration of war, they prepared for military combat. These rituals were supposedly directed against Cleopatra, but they were really against Anthony. Following the sea battle at Actium, the aftermath of defeat. Source, Diocasius, Histories, Book 51, page 5. Cleopatra quickly returned to Egypt, afraid that her subjects would rebel if they heard of the disaster before she arrived. In order to get into port safely, she decorated the prows of her ships with garlands, as though she had actually won a victory. She had flute players accompany chants of triumph. But as soon as she reached safety, she had many important men killed. Cleopatra knew they had always been discontented and were now elated over her disaster. Then she gathered the vast wealth from their estates and from various other sources, even the most holy shrines. Cleopatra re-equipped her forces and looked about for allies. She put to death the Armenian king and sent his head to the king of the Medes in the hope that he might help her. Meanwhile, Anthony had sailed to Africa where the army was protecting Egypt under the command of Penarius Scarpus. But Scarpus had the men Anthony sent ahead killed and refused to see him. Furthermore, any soldiers who disagreed with this decision were executed. So, Anthony returned to Alexandria without having accomplished anything. Source Plutarch Life of Anthony Passage 69 Anthony had entrusted his Libyan forces to a general, and when this man defected to Octavian, Anthony tried to kill himself, but he was prevented by his friends and brought to Alexandria. In Alexandria, Anthony found Cleopatra about to undertake an extremely hazardous scheme to escape war and servitude. Cleopatra planned to settle away from Egypt with considerable funds and a large force. Now the boundary between Asia and Africa lies on the Egyptian isthmus between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. The narrowest place between these two seas measures about 300 furlongs. Cleopatra decided to raise her fleet out of the water and drag her ships across this isthmus 
and launch them again in the Red Sea. But the Arabians around Petra burned the first ships that were hauled up onto the land. As for Anthony, he had thought that his land forces at Actium were still holding together. So Cleopatra stayed to guard the approaches to the country instead of fleeing Octavian. You have been listening to a broadcast of ancient source material concerning the downfall of Mark Anthony. Part 2 of this broadcast focuses on the death of Antony and the fate of Cleopatra Ptolemy and her alleged son with Julius Caesar. Thank you.